Thanks very much, Rod. Today I'm going to talk to you about uh, how we can engineer the optimal diet. So to give you an overview of where we're heading, first up we're going to talk about insulin and obesity, um, talk about how our food influences that with uh, the food insulin index. Being paleo, we're going to talk about nutrient density and then talk about how we can bring all those things together to um, optimise our food choices for different goals. Everything can be solved with a spreadsheet when you're in Gen <laughs> So um, first up, I'm an engineer, I'm not a doctor. I like to see things in numbers and understand them and, and uh, manipulate those numbers to be able to apply them to my life. I'm personally invested in this approach. Um, this is how my family eat. And um, I've got a blog. Uh, about uh, six months ago, I started sharing some ideas on the food insulin index and nutrition and uh, nutrient density and uh, yeah, last weekend clocked up a quarter of a million views which was completely mind-blowing and uh, it's been quite a journey and it's a pleasure to be here to share it with you today. So the obvious uh, elephant in the room is uh, why is an engineer here talking to you about nutrition? Well, it's, uh, for me it's personal. I've got a family history of obesity and diabetes. I've struggled over time to maintain my own weight in spite of trying to eat healthy and exercise. About 12 months ago, I got some blood tests that um, indicated I was developing fatty liver and uh, metabolic syndrome, as a lot of the people in the audience are probably struggling with as well. Um, but more importantly, my wife, Monica, is a uh, type 1 diabetic. She's had it since she was 10, and together we've been through two pregnancies. And I suppose through learning, uh, living day to day with type 2 and type 1 diabetes, I've gained an intimate understanding of what it, um, what it means to optimise blood sugar management for health, vitality and well-being. So um, Grant was talking about insulin. Um, you've probably heard it's an, ana uh, an anabolic hormone, which what that means is it helps you grow. It helps you grow muscle, but also helps you grow fat, which is good for survival. Um, people with type 1 diabetes uh, tend to lose weight very rapidly as soon as they do when they're diagnosed. Um, and without insulin, what happens is we can't access our own blood glucose that we digest, so we cannibalise our own um, body fat and muscle in a process called ketoacidosis. That's when you've got very high ketones, very high blood sugar and very low insulin. Um, with insulin, same child, two months later, um, we quickly gain weight again, um, sometimes too much. And I suppose today I'm going to talk to you about how we can potentially optimise and balance too much, too little. Where do we, how do we find that middle ground? A little bit closer to home, um, this is my kids. Proud dad moment. Um, after nine months in a high insulin environment, i.e. my wife, um, a type 1 diabetic typically delivers uh, through C-section early due to high birth weight, due to the high insulin and high blood sugars. Uh, calories in, calories out, says my kids should have, you know, not been so slothly and exercised more and uh, got out, seen the sun and, and not been a glut, so gluttonous, but um, maybe it was the insulin. This is, a, this is the kids now, they're happy, healthy, vital and uh, full of life, love them to death. Even closer to home, this is me um, before and after my journey. Um, my dad was saying before it was worse, but uh, yeah, <laughs> thanks dad. <laughs> um, yeah, so this is before and after discovering uh, the importance of manipulating insulin in our diet. Uh, nutrient density and maybe a bit of fasting thrown in. So as, as Grant was saying, um, you know, it's a bit of a controversial question to say is low carb optimal for everybody, but if you're insulin resistant, um, different study to the A to Z, but a similar sort of conclusion that for people who are insulin resistant, uh, they have a much better chance of losing weight on a, on a low carbohydrate, low insulin load diet. What happens is, as you can see, is um, that the lower insulin, like in the, in the type 1 diabetic child before they're, before they're given insulin, um, they're able to release their own body fat for, store, uh, for fuel. And a low carbohydrate diet is also indicated to be easier st to stick to if you're insulin resistant. But in reality, most people who have a high BMI uh, also have um, high insulin levels. So if you're obese, you're probably insulin resistant. So in practice, what happens is your high insulin leads to more anabolic fat storage, increased appetite. So every little bit of morsel, every morsel of food that goes in your mouth with high insulin circulating in your blood, a little bit goes onto your, your hips and your waist. And uh, you just need to, to feel good, you just need to get that little bit more food. 
but if we can manipulate and reduce our insulin load of our diet um, through, uh, we will achieve usage of our body fat for, store, uh, for, for energy and potentially decreased uh, overall appetite. So if insulin is so important, um, how can we better understand that, calculate it, and, uh, and manage it, I suppose, as an engineer, that's you know, how we think. Um, you may have heard of the glycemic index, which is uh, our blood sugar response to food over a period of two hours relative to glucose. Um, some really exciting research has been done recently, um, largely at the University of Sydney, where they've looked at the food insulin index, which is a similar sort of approach, where they've looked at the um, sat 10 people down, given them the same 1,000 kilojoules of food, and measured their insulin over two or three hours, compared that back to the response to, to glucose. Um, so what that does, uh, in the, the glycemic index would give you um, you're just your blood sugar, which is going to be dependent on how insulin resistant you are and how your pancreas functions. But I think the uh, food insulin index is potentially more exciting because it it's an indication of your dietary glucose metabolised, so it gives you a better understanding of how the food you're eating is going to influence your blood glucose reaction. Uh, so there are 10 different people testing the same food and they take the average area under the curve of those. So, um, so up until recently there was only a small group of uh, tests, 38 tests had been done in the food insulin index and um, after hearing about this in a video with Jason Fong, he talked about how potentially people on Atkins can take protein too far, which is insulinogenic, and then they end up not achieving all of the goals that they were, they were going for. So well, that's interesting, especially being married to a type 1 diabetic. Searched and searched, and finally came across some um, thesis paper by Kirstine Bell from the University of Sydney, released in 2014. Um, where they'd taken the original data and extended that to try and develop a system to better manage type 1 diabetics to, to calculate their dosing and optimise food choices for type 2 diabetes. So being curious, um, downloaded the data, threw it into a spreadsheet, and uh, here's the data. You can sort of say, well, carbohydrate is, you know, vaguely proportional to insulin response, but at the same time it's really scattered, it's a bit all over the place, it's like, you know, carbohydrate, insulin, what, what is the relationship? What you can see is definitely high fat foods, low insulin response, high glucose foods, high insulin response. But where it gets a little bit more puzzling, the uh, high protein foods that have got a low carbohydrate also have quite a significant insulin response. Um, high fibre foods, you know, have a lower than you'd expect insulin response, and then fructose foods have a lower insulin response as well. So I thought, oh, that's interesting. Let's let's play with the numbers um, and through a bit of you know statistical mucking around and sensitivity analysis. What you can do is manipulate that. So what you can see is net carbohydrate, which is carbohydrate minus fibre, plus about half the protein gives you a much better relationship between. Um, food we eat and the insulin response. So obvious conclusion, fantastic, we'll just eat butter and olive oil, all good. <laughs> but uh, you know, Leah's probably having conniptions here going, no, what about the nutrients? So that's the, the obvious response and you know, having a bit of a paleo headspace as well, I thought maybe we need to look at the nutrient density, maybe it's not all about the insulin, maybe you know, insulin, there's a balance between insulin and, and nutrition at the same time. So. Um, Moving on to the paleo part of the segment, um, uh, Paul Jaminet of uh, The Perfect Health Diet says a nourishing, balanced diet that provides all the required nutrients in the right proportions is the key to eliminating hunger and minimising appetite at minimal caloric intake. What that means in layman's terms is really that if you're eating a whole food, nutrient-dense diet, you go, mm, OK, I've got what I need, I've got the protein, I've got the micronutrients, I've got the fat, I'm happy, I'm full don't need to keep searching for more food. But conversely, if you're eating, you know, chips and coke and white bread or whatever, you're just going to go, oh, I'm not quite satisfied, I need some more protein, I need some more, need some more input, and I'll keep on eating, and you might end up eating a whole lot more. So a number of attempts have been made to quantify nutrient density, which are quite fascinating to me, being a nerdy engineer. Um, Joel Furman, who you might have heard of, looked at nutrient density per calorie, uh, which is useful for people trying to lose weight because it comes up with a whole lot of uh, nutrient-dense green leafy vegetables. 
Uh, Matt Lalonde, pictured here of CrossFit Paleo fame, uh, looked at nutrient density per weight of food, and a lot of what I'll show you later is heavily influenced by his work. Um, that prioritised basically paleo foods, like nuts, seeds, organ meats, bacon. Um, but then, as we saw before, what about diabetes? What about weight loss? How do we bring it all together? And I thought maybe we can combine the two approaches to design maybe the ultimate food ranking system. So what we've got as inputs for that is um, nutrient density per calorie and weight, fibre per calorie and weight, uh, calorie density, so you know mushrooms, need to eat a lot of them to get really full um, and, and, to, and, and to get a lot of calories and then uh, the percentage of insulogenic calories as you mentioned before which is our response of our insulin to our food. So as I said one individual parameter, interesting, not particularly useful though, but I think things get really exciting when we can combine all those parameters um, into, into a system designed for individual people. So at work we use a process called a multi-criteria analysis, which is a you know big long word to a big long phrase to really mean just bringing together a lot of data. Um, say you're designing a motorway alignment, you've got koalas over here, people over there, you know, power lines there, mountains there. You, you need to shortlist a number of possible options that you can take forward. So I thought maybe we can use this sort of approach with the USDA Foods database, that not just has the macronutrients for more than 8,000 foods, it's got all the micronutrients, it's a massive database of information. So if we're going to design a, a new uh, way of ranking food, you've got to agree what the parameters are, so obviously vitamins, 12 vitamins, 10 minerals, amino acids, um, as we talked about before, amino acids are insulinogenic, meaning they will generate insulin, so Rod talked about moderate protein. But at the same time, um, they're very nutrient dense, very nutritious, and very good for us. So we need to find that balance point for our particular situation. Then, if you're eating a high fat diet, um, you've got to think about a little bit more potentially about the contents of those fats. Most people uh, will agree that omega 3 fatty acids, fish, etc., are fantastic for your health. Med Mediterranean diet approach emphasizes. Uh, uh, olive oil, which is oleic acid, 18.1. And then um, there's been some really fascinating work, Grants have alluded to it before, um, where they've looked at the effect of particular fractions of the fatty acids on metabolic health and, uh, and their insulin resistance. So Darius Mosaferin from Harvard has uh, done some really great work looking at these other fatty acids, and, uh, and so I've basically taken those as beneficial. So all up got 43 different uh, fractions, micronutrients that we can say we like them. So the ideal food from all that, you're not going to get one perfect food, but the ideal would be to have high nutrient density across a wide range of different foods. So just in the spreadsheet we can sum that up. Um, so is there one perfect diet? Rod would probably wouldn't have been running these conferences if there was, and there'd be a whole lot <coughs> less discussion on Facebook if there was just a one approach, but I think we can use this multi-criteria analysis to tailor our diet for different goals, be they weight loss, diabetes, nutritional ketosis, therapeutic, therapeutic ketosis, and for those lucky enough to be insulin sensitive and metabolically healthy. So um, not to dive too deep into the, the detail here, but uh, just to look at the weightings I've used for these different approaches for therapeutic ketosis relies very heavily on the insulogenic factor, so you want a, a, a bunch of foods that can have a very low insulin response. But at the same time, um, people battling metabolic diseases such as cancer and epilepsy shouldn't just be eating fat, they should be maximising nutrient density at the same time. For people looking at diabetes and nutritional ketosis, a little bit less emphasis on the insulin and uh, more on the calorie density, fibre, uh, fat loss. If you're lucky enough to have uh, stabilised your blood sugars, but uh, you've still got a bit more weight to lose, this approach increases the uh, or decreases the calorie density, so you've got to get through a lot more food and uh, maximises the nutrient density. And then if you're all good, metabolically healthy, you're just a ferocious athlete wanting to run as fast as you can, uh, we, we go for the nutrient density per weight. So 
uh, moving on to, to what that looks like in practice, if uh, what I've done here is said you've got 8,000 foods, let's take the top 500 of those based on the various ranking criteria. Um, if we just look at the most nutrient dense, it ends up being a very high protein, um, low net carbohydrate diet, so basically a lot of non starchy veggies. Um, typical Western diet, it's about 50% uh, net carbohydrate versus. 16% protein, so you can see they're, they're quite different. What's wrong with this picture? If, uh, if you're aiming for therapeutic ketosis, what the system does is, is minimizes your overall insulin load. Down here on this line is the starvation limit for, uh, for your insulin load. If you're diabetic, potentially you can have a bit more protein, or well, quite a lot of protein, but overall net, low net carbs which the benefit of that, it gives you a slow glucose release from the protein through gluconeogenesis. So if, um, if, your, kid, if your pancreas sorry, is trying to keep up, um, it, 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 it can, your, your pancreas with poor insulin sensitivity can keep up with the glucose coming from gluconeogenesis. Or if you're type 1 injecting, it's much easier to, to balance those, uh, the, the blood sugar roller coaster. If you're an athlete or weight lo looking for weight loss, uh, you've got slightly, you've got still a fairly high protein diet, but um, l a little bit higher in net carbohydrates. So just to give you a quick snapshot, um, if you were here last year, you would have seen Steve Finney's uh, well-formulated ketogenic diet triangle, which um, this orange line here is that threshold between ketogenesis, it, where Finney believes that sort of the cutover point between ketosis and, and not necessarily producing as many ketones. So the therapeutic ketosis approach prioritizes fats and oils, butter, avocados, egg, etc. So you can see it's a, it's a high fat, highly nutrient dense diet. Um, these foods that rank really well over here, chili powder, basil, are a little bit higher in carbohydrate, but they're highly nutrient dense and that's how they make it into the list. If you're struggling to maintain your blood sugars, um, any of these, tick any of these boxes, then potentially a lower insulin load diet for you uh, is appropriate for you. So as I mentioned before, if you're able to decrease the overall insulin circulating in your body, there's going to be a better chance you're going to be able to access your own body fat that's stored for energy. So that's where these foods sit. Um, again, it's, it's, it's nuts and seeds uh, with, with a good amount of fat for those people. Um, <coughs> This is all fairly complex, but on, on the blog, what I've done and basically what we've lived by for the last six months is just a, a short list of, on an A4 sheet that we stick to the fridge and say, what do I eat today? And it's just a short list of uh, the most nutrient dense, low insulin foods, and it's really been beneficial for our family. Then moving on to fat loss, if you get to a point where you're able to stabilize your blood sugars, um, but still have some weight to lose, you end up with a uh, really, low calorie density, high fiber diet, maybe a little bit more carbohydrates, but uh, you probably can't imagine yourself sitting in front of three episodes of Game of Thrones binging on like parsley, liver, spinach, coriander. Um, so obviously these foods are gonna fill you up, they're gonna be nutrient dense, they're gonna leave you satiated and really happy um, and not looking for more food like yeah, once you pop you just can't stop. And if you're lucky enough to be metabolically healthy and insulin sensitive, um, this top 500 basically ends up looking like a nutrient-dense paleo-type diet. So quantitatively, um, it's, it's a real validation of this way of life, whether it, and you can moderate it and refine it based on your insulin resistance. So in summary, I think um, both nutrient density and insulin load are critical to optimising nutrition. You can refine the different factors for different goals. Um, a low-carb, nutrient-dense approach is potentially most useful for people who are insulin-resistant and have diabetes. And um, if you want uh, just a simple short list of foods to check out and meals, uh, check out the blog. Thank you very much.